I want to talk to you tonight about migration, which has been the subject of my research, the main research interest for me over the past decade. That's not a good sign, is it? <laughs> I'm fine okay, so like many people who study migration, my interest in the topic came from my own experiences. So both as a migrant myself, when I lived in Kentucky and Nottingham and spent a good bit of time in South Africa, but also from growing up in the northwest of Ireland, which is a place that was and continues to be profoundly shaped by migration. My immediate family is scattered around the English-speaking world. Um, most of my aunts and uncles and cousins live in the UK, the US and Australia, as do all of my siblings and my nieces. My grandparents lived in New York for seven years, moving there in the 1920s and returning to rural Leitrim, where they had five children, two of whom subsequently emigrated again to the US. When I was younger, our lives were punctuated by those long distance relationships and the arrival of parcels of clothes that had previously been worn by my older cousins in the UK, or the visits home by relatives from the US with the inevitable tensions about just how many showers they needed and what that was doing to the immersion. <laughs> now, the visits go both ways, and we use social media instead of post and expensive phone calls to keep in touch. The form of connections may have changed, but the networks that link together people in place, often across long distances, remain the same. I'm a geographer, and so the relationship between people and place is at the core of how I understand the world. Migration often complicates this relationship because it raises questions around belonging. My interest in belonging stretches back to my early days as an undergraduate student in UCD, where my first tutor was the humanistic geographer Anne Buttimer. In her 1976 paper, Grasping the Dynamism of the Life World, Anne wrote about the significance of understanding holistically how humans make a home on this earth. She called this dwelling, I call it belonging, but we both see this process as illuminated by the practice of migration and the experiences of migrants. I use the term belonging because I think it captures more poetically the tension between migration, which we see in terms of mobility and movement and change, and homemaking, which we often see as fixed and static and rooted in place. And that tension between movement and status and between who is considered in and out of place is at the heart of many contemporary concerns about migration and migrants and more broadly about the nature of our society. This tension is exacerbated by the ways in which we seek to make sense of migration in the current moment. In their best-selling textbook, Stephen Castle's Mark Miller and Heinde Hatz describe this as the age of migration. It's an evocative description, but it's so loose that it means both everything and nothing. This age of migration extends all the way back to the 16th century and incorporates both international and internal migration. The temporal and spatial boundaries of this so-called age of migration are thus porous. It's difficult to identify where or when it begins. Yet naming and claiming it in this way represents an exceptionalizing tendency that is present in much of what's written or said about migration. But there's something new or different about this poorly defined period or that what is happening now has never happened in quite this way before. And this exceptionalizing tendency is exacerbated when we realize that migration most often comes to our attention at times of crisis, through flashpoints linked to death or violence or increasingly natural disasters. Yet most migration is not a response to a dramatic crisis. Most migrants move homes and create new lives in uneventful and ordinary ways. There are many similarities between the lives of migrants and the lives of those who've remained in place. As people, we seek to have somewhere to live, an income to live on, relationships to sustain us, activities to engage us, and ways of accessing help when we need it. We also share similar challenges in seeking to meet these desires, particularly in a world that's become more insecure and precarious for many of us. Precariousness, Isabel Laurie says, is an integral part of the human condition. We all experience precariousness in different ways. But precarity, in contrast, is the translation of this human condition into social categories that emphasize differences and hierarchies. As Laurie describes it, and I quote from her, the precariousness shared with others is placed into hierarchies and judged, and precarious lives are segmented. These hierarchies can be created in a variety of ways, 
They can be created economically, politically, socially, or legally, for example. And the result of this process is precarity. When we talk about precarity in today's world, we often use it in relation to insecure employment, uncertain income or housing tenure, or perhaps the effects of climate change. But while precarity is experienced by many, it's important to realise that it may be intensified for migrants. Migrants often face particular challenges in making new homes and new lives, challenges that might not be easily evident to others. Those issues, what I've called the challenges to belonging in a precarious world, and how we as researchers might respond to them, are the main focus of my talk this evening. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to discuss two main topics. First, I'm going to look at what I call the state of migration, how states aim to control and measure migration. This matters because these practices shape the way in which migration and migrants are officially known and understood. And second, I'm going to introduce you to how I and others have added to this official knowledge, particularly through a focus on what Anne Buttermer called life worlds, or what we might now describe as everyday geographies. By focusing on people's experiences, we can learn more about migration and migrants, and also about the societies that we live in. And I'm going to conclude by considering the important work of placing migration, of making space for migration and migrants. As is very obvious, this work has taken on a new urgency in the current moment, where migration and migrants are increasingly blamed and scapegoated for other issues and problems that are not of their making. These topics are beautifully illustrated by Jimmy's Hall, a 2004 14 film by British filmmaker Ken Loach. The film tells the story of Jimmy Broughton, born in rural Leitrim, close to where my migrant grandparents grew up in 1886. Like many others of his generation and since, Gralton emigrated to the US. There, he became a US citizen, and unlike many of his generation, including my grandparents, he also became a communist. Jimmy Gralton returned to Leitrim twice, the first time in 1921, and again in 1932. The hall in the title of the film was a community hall that Gralton opened on his parents' farm, a center for music and dance and meetings, and for organizing political action. The second time Gralton returned to Leitrim, he drew hostile attention from the local clergy, who conspired to have him declared a communist agent. The state quickly responded. Jimmy Gralton, an Irish citizen, was deported from Ireland as an undesirable alien and died 13 years later in New York, age 59. The story of Jimmy Gralton shows the power of the state to define and control migration. It also shows how states use migrants both to demonstrate their power and to divert attention from other potentially problematic issues. For me, though, it also interweaves with the stories of my grandparents who lived in New York and returned from New York contemporaneously with Gralton. While he was deported, they remained and they spent the rest of their long lives living in relative poverty in the rural area where they grew up. Their experiences and his provide insights into migration and the challenges of belonging through the links that connect people and places in often unexpected ways. People move, but states create international migrants. And that distinction is important. When we talk about migration today, it's most often in terms of an act that crosses international borders. The nature of those borders and the conditions under which people are free to cross them are defined by states. A state could, if it wished, choose to open its borders and allow unlimited mobility into and out of its territory. The United States, for example, had an ostensible open-door policy in the mid to late 19th century. The states no longer take this option. By the time my grandparents moved to New York in the 1920s, they benefited from a quota system that favoured immigrants from Ireland. Controlling migration and migrants has now become one of the main ways in which contemporary states exercise their power and their control. And this happens through legislation, through policy, and through statistics. What we're increasingly seeing in Ireland and elsewhere is the use of legislation and policy and state-gathered statistics to create distinctions between different types of migrants, between those who are considered desirable and those who are considered unwelcome in what geographer Linda McDowell has called a hierarchy of acceptability. In Ireland, our approach to controlling migration in recent years has been multifaceted. There's been a significant increase in migration-related legislation, much of which is focused on prohibitions and restrictions. 
There's been a move towards the use of statutory instruments rather than acts. These delegate decision-making powers to ministers who can then make laws without a Rothbard's approval. The country's labour migration policy has been designed to prioritise the needs of employers. There's been growth in the numbers of, Im of immigrants with precarious legal status, such as international students, and in the numbers of asylum seekers trapped for years in direct provision. Legislation and policy matters because it sets the conditions for migration and indicates, whether explicitly or implicitly, who's considered in or out of place and who is assumed to have a right to belong. But legislation and policy is just one aspect of how states control migration. Another aspect is how states frame our understanding of migration. And this also matters because our knowledge about migration is most often state-centred. And this goes right back to the start of when academics began to organise and frame how we think about migration. We see this in the first systematic attempt to explain migration, an 1885 paper called The Laws of Migration, written by geographer Ernst Ravenstein. This remains an incredibly influential paper. In our new metrics of excellence, the paper has been cited over 4,000 times in total, with over 1,000 of those citations coming in the last five years. But when we look at this paper in more detail, we see the problems of how Ravenstein explained migration and how these problems persist today. Ravenstein developed his laws of migration based on his detailed study of the 1871 and the 1881 censuses in Britain and Ireland. Specifically, he looked at where people were born and where they then lived, but only within the borders of the United Kingdom. While he acknowledges that, and I quote, emigration to foreign parts is also of some influence, more especially in Ireland, this is not accounted for in his research. And this matters for two of Ravenstein's laws in particular, laws that are still being used to describe and explain migration. The first law states that most migrants travel short distances. This claim was made while ignoring just how far most migrants from Ireland were traveling in this post famine period. Fitzpatrick calculated that around 60% of the Irish living outside Ireland in 1870 were in the United States, compared to around 25% in Britain. The second law states that female migrants travel shorter distances than men. But this is clearly not the case when Irish migration to North America is taken into consideration. Around half of the Irish migrants to the US between 1856 and 1921 were women. To illustrate his laws, Ravenstein, who was a trained and practicing, practicing cartographer, filled the paper with hand-drawn maps. Here's an example. It's a map of the Anglo-Scotch element, um, which includes in Ireland. And it's clearly linked to what Ravenstein calls the floating population, the 21% of those living in Ireland, born in Britain, who were soldiers or sailors. This map's important for how we've come to understand migration, because it focuses on identifying migrants as different and on representing that difference in spatial forms. This is now a standard way of showing migrants on a map. Ravenstein's focus was on what was happening within state boundaries, illustrated by the maps that he drew. And this focus has influenced how we show the presence of migrants in particular places. A focus in turn has caused Ravenstein to miss other really important movements of people. The laws that he framed excluded those movements, and misrepresented migration in ways that had lasting effects. The shaping of realities through maps that fixed people in place and through laws that elided actually occurring movements of people tell an important story about knowledge production and how absences shape what we think we know, often in crucial ways. The same types of absences and problematic presences are evident if we consider how migration is counted and measured in contemporary Ireland. State-sponsored data collection provides the basis for general claims about migration flows, so that's the movement of people into and out of and within Ireland, and also about migrant stocks, the people currently living in Ireland who are identified as migrants. The figures about migrant flows are released each year in the Central Statistics Office Population and Migration Estimates. The release of these figures gives rise to reports and opinion pieces most often about whether or not Irish nationals are leaving or returning to the country. But at most of the entry points to Ireland, there are no or few records kept of who's moving into the country, and there's no formal population register for most people who arrive. 
So as a consequence, immigration flows to Ireland are estimated through a whole range of other sources, like applications for PPS numbers, or through the labour force survey, or through the small number of people who have to apply for visas. And there are still fewer records kept of people leaving the country, so we're mostly relying on statistics from the countries that people are moving to, like the UK, the Australia, like the UK, Australia, and the US. So in reality, the only claim that we can make with any kind of certainty about migration flows to and from Ireland is that our statistics are partial and incomplete, that they fail to capture the complexity of contemporary migration, and that they provide only a blurry snapshot of who migrates. But nonetheless, rather like Ravenstein, we continue to make authoritative claims of the migration flow based on uncertain data. The consequences of this were clear in the 2004 citizenship referendum, which was described as closing a loophole that allowed large numbers of pregnant women to come to Ireland to give birth. After the referendum, it quickly emerged that the Yes campaign was based on the deliberate misrepresentation of um, flawed statistics. And this significant change to citizenship, the official form of belonging in Ireland, was enabled by gaps in data on migration. At the same time, our official knowledge about migrants living in Ireland, what's officially known as migrant stock, is also patchy. There are lots of reasons for this, again connected to the data that's collected and how we interpret it. A starting point is a lack of clarity about who exactly is a migrant. This is because many of the official publications in Ireland focus on a particular category of migrant, the so-called non-national. Think for a moment about the meaning of that term. And its emphasis on the negative, it insists that a person living in Ireland does not belong to Ireland, and it challenges their right to belong because of their nationality. It equally insists that a person with Irish nationality is not a migrant, even if they've lived most of their lives outside the country. In recent year, years, the significant increase in people attaining Irish citizenship, over 120,000 since 2011, has caused new complications. If new Irish citizens identify as Irish nationals, particularly in the state-sponsored surveys with limited tick box options, their migration experiences are raised. We know from other contexts that when migrant status is made invisible, challenges to belonging that migrants experience are minimized and discounted. So for example, it was only after 2001 when the Irish ethnic category was finally introduced into the UK census that the social polarization and the health inequalities experienced by many Irish migrants in their country could be clearly identified. The Irish state's current efforts to gather data mask the experiences of migrant children, of newly nationalised Irish, and of returning Irish, though we know from other sources that these groups, pays, or these groups face particular challenges to belonging. So legislation, policies, and statistics represent the language of the state. They define who belongs and under what terms. And when this language is accepted uncritically, as a representation of the truth, the consequences for migrants can be particularly stark. So in this context, when our knowledge about migration and migrants is so often shaped by states, academics play an important role. Our first role is to critically examine the ways in which powerful discourses are created, reinforced and maintained. And our second role is to add to existing knowledge by highlighting the stories and the experiences that are perhaps less known. Some of my research has cast a critical eye on the metrics and measures of migration using existing data to raise questions about exclusion or to draw attention to specific challenges faced by migrants living in Ireland. So as an example, I've used census data going back to 2006 to show the disproportionate concentration of migrants in private rental accommodation and to emphasise how this creates obstacles to belonging. More recently, I've worked with Jenny Dagg to show that migrant integration outcomes are spatially differentiated, so that where people live in Ireland profoundly affects their ability to belong. I've also worked with Cleona Murphy and Leanne Caulfield to highlight the limited attention that public bodies in Ireland pay to the question of integration. But I've also worked, most often with others, to provide new insights into the life worlds or the everyday geographies of migrants living in Ireland. And tonight I want to particularly emphasise that this knowledge is not produced by me as an individual. It's the outcome of collaborations with others in research, in teaching and in writing that have enriched my understanding in a variety of ways 
and that continue to do so through the ongoing and innovative work of PhD students Sasha Brown and Siobhan Madden. And tonight I'd also like to remember the work of Matt Stevens, um, who left us just about a year ago. So for a number of years, um, sociolinguist Bettina Miga and I worked on a research project that examined the experiences of recent migrants to Ireland. We came up with the idea for the research project in 2007 and started the research in 2008 with the support of the Irish Research Council. We designed a longitudinal qualitative research project where we would meet with recent migrants to Ireland a number of times to talk to them about their experiences and to understand how those experiences change over time. What we didn't realise when we started planning the research was that Ireland was about to experience a profound recession and as a result her conversations with people became more anxious and fraught as the research progressed. Bettina and I have written a lot about the research. We had to learn about each other's disciplines and we had to make adjustments to how we were both trained to con conduct research interviews. So to explain, uh, social scientists like geographers are often told to remove themselves from the interview process and to avoid making interview participants feel uncomfortable or angry. While sociolinguists are trained to overcome the observer's paradox and to encourage people to speak in as regular a way as possible. So those differences meant that we were very often uncomfortable with each other's style of interviewing. And Bettina couldn't understand why I didn't challenge interviewees, and I couldn't understand why she did. But in the process, though, we learned a lot about ourselves, about research, and about the everyday geographies of migrants living in Ireland. Elsewhere, we've written about our methodology and different findings, which include observations on the effects of the recession, on language use and the meaning of home, on people accessing healthcare, on British migrants in Ireland, and on pathways to integration for European migrants. But this evening, though, given my insistence on centering challenges to belonging, I want to talk about one particular group that we met during our research, a group that we've described as migrant mothers. Ireland offers a fascinating site for a study of migrant mothers. We have Article 41 in the 1937 Constitution, which makes a direct reference to mothers, claiming that the state shall endeavour to ensure that mothers shall not be obliged by economic necessity to engage in labour to the neglect of their duties in the home. For many years, that translated to the marriage bar, which, ser which served to stop married women like my mother from working outside the home. But more recently, this has changed. Female participation in the labour force has increased significantly. There's paid maternity leave, there's extended parental leave periods. And there's also been a growth in childcare facilities, though many are private and expensive, and there's limited enforcement of compliance with regulatory standards. So as a result, it's very difficult to access affordable childcare particularly in cities like Dublin. During our research, we realised that migrant mothers faced a range of specific challenges that were not well addressed in broader research on migration to Ireland. Difficulties in accessing affordable childcare meant that many of the migrant women we met, especially those with young children, were full-time mothers. This was particularly the case if they did not have family members in Ireland who could step in to help with childcare which is often how gaps in childcare provision are addressed in this country. So as a consequence, many of the women we spoke to had resigned themselves to being full-time carers for their children. They were often ambivalent about this, expressing a sense of being isolated or de-skilled and of missing work. None of the women we spoke to expressed a desire to remain as a stay-at-home parent in the long term. And some were very conflicted about what it would mean for their sense of identity. One woman, an older woman who had always been financially independent, found this transition really difficult. She was vociferous about state failings, saying they don't stimulate women in the workforce, they force you to give up your job instead of trying to help you and support you and keep you in your job. And there are no childcare facilities and there's no flexibility and there's no financial support for that. Many migrant mothers thus faced considerable challenges to belonging. And they were unable to work outside the home, so that cut off one important option for creating networks of belonging. If they didn't have family networks in Ireland, they disproportionately depend on friendships with other migrant women to accomplish their everyday lives. Excluded from work environments and with limited or no family support, they were forced into defining themselves as mothers in a context where mothers are assigned a specific and restricted role, and they had limited options to forge connections with Ireland outside of networks related to mothering and caring. So while the women we spoke to worked really hard to forge those connections, which included participating in our research project, it often made them aware of not belonging 
in ways that they found emotionally difficult. The Irish state and constitution may say it supports mothers, but it doesn't happen in practice for many migrant mothers who struggle as a consequence to fully belong. The, difficult, the different challenges to belonging experienced by recent migrants to Ireland have also been the focus of research that I've been privileged to supervise at Maynooth. And Dr. Elaine Burroughs, PhD, which was later published by Nomos Press in Germany, provides a detailed and insightful account of Irish parliamentary and media discourses around so-called illegal immigrants. Elaine's research is important because it shows the ways in which hierarchies of acceptability are maintained, in this instance by miscategorizing people as illegal immigrants and by insisting on their negative influence and effects. And this is in contrast to the representations of Irish illegal migrants in the US, who are mostly seen as benign and unthreatening and in need of help. As Elaine points out, what people say and write about migrants, particularly in powerful institutions like the Dáil or in widely circulated media accounts, can have real tangible effects on society. In her research, Elaine points out how refugees and asylum seekers are conflated with illegal immigrants in public discourses. Dr. Zoe O'Reilly, whose PhD will be published as a manuscript later, as a monograph later this year, focused on the experiences of asylum seekers living in direct provision in Ireland. Zoe used a participatory photography method where she gave people cameras, trained them in photography and in digital skills, and in collaboration with the participants, held an exhibition and published a book showcasing people's images, words, and stories. Organising the exhibition provided an important insight into what it feels like to live in direct provision. The original exhibition, which was due to be held in the town where the direct provision centre was located, was cancelled by participants, who felt unsafe when the centre manager received a letter from the Department of Justice and Equality saying they would attend its opening night, but they hadn't been invited. Later, we held the exhibition on campus, and one of the images from the book and exhibition has stayed with me a montage of images of corridors, the most photographed scene in, Zoe, in Zoe's project. As she described it, the corridors and their doors seem to represent what being in the asylum system and in a DP centre meant for so many people. Lack of control, confinement, sadness. Dr. John Waters also used images in his PhD research on the geographies of everyday life for migrants living in Ireland. John asked the people who participated in his research project people with Indian, Lithuanian, or US nationality, what feels most like home to you? And he asked them to use an image to illustrate their answer. People brought photographs of the exteriors and interiors of the places where they now or previously lived. They showed images of the objects that they carried with them and of the family members, including pets, who made their accommodation feel like home to them. Through his research, John shows that what he calls migrant homescapes are rarely restricted to just one place but they extend across space and time and scale. And that home is, in John's words, a spatialized performance of belonging. More recently, Dr. Stephen Lucas explored, explored a particular aspect of migrant life in Ireland, specifically why migrants living in Ireland are less likely to be self-employed than migrants in many other countries. Stephen identified the structural barriers that all aspiring entrepreneurs faced in Ireland during the economic crisis, getting access to business finance, and developing markets for their goods and services. This was intensified for many migrants because their economic or their social capital was much more limited. As Stephen shows in his thesis, the current emphasis on self-employment and entrepreneurship as a means to economic advancement for migrants and others fails to address the structural constraints that result in barriers to participation and broader inequalities. From all of these different research projects, I've highlighted the specific challenges that migrants, to, migrants face, the challenges to belonging that migrants face in Ireland. This is because, as Bridget Anderson points out, it's important to be able to show the differences that matter between migrants and those who've not moved. Those differences contribute to the precarious worlds of many migrants. It could be the different ways in which politicians and journalists describe migrants, the specific experiences of particular groups of migrants in their encounters with the Irish state, or the ways in which Irish society has a sedentary bias expressed in the questioning of belonging that many migrants here experience. But where are you really from? It's also important, though, to see the threads that link together these different research projects 
Projects that are fundamentally about who gets to belong and under what conditions and how we all make efforts to shape our own sense of belonging in place. Earlier this evening, I introduced you to the story of Jimmy Grelton and its retelling in the film version of Jimmy's Hall. When I first saw that film and learned about Grelton, it made me reflect on migration in a number of unexpected ways. In particular, it made me think about my grandparents, who lived in New York for around seven years, but who never spoke to me about that experience or about their return to Ireland. The only evidence I've seen of my grandparents' time in New York is the shipping record that shows their initial journey from Cork. Their lives in New York, their ordinary lives, remain unknown to me. I thought about the New York that they and Jimmy Grelton lived in, and about the lives of many other migrants living there at the same time. Most of those stories are also lost, though they're the foundations on which a place like New York is built. And even Grelton's story was unknown to me for most of my life, though like him, I was born in Leitrim, and I grew up not so far away in neighboring Sligo. Instead, the type of migration memorialized in the Northwest was the Sligo Street named after John F. Kennedy, JFK Parade. If states have the prerogative in naming and placing migration, then we're directed to read Jimmy Grelton in one way, as an object of fear, as a threat to the integrity of the state, and as someone who has to be dealt with through deportation. In this way of considering the place of migration, what matters is securing borders and making sure that migrants remain in the place they're assigned, while at the same time marking migrants as different. But if we refuse to be bound by state-sanctioned definitions of migration and migrants, we can read Jimmy Grelton in another way, as one of many people who left for a litre, and as someone who used his experiences in urban New York to imagine a different future for the rural place where he was born. Geographer Cindy Katz describes this as a counter-topography, which she explains as linking together places and people that we think of as different in order to understand their commonalities of experience. One of the ways that Grelton did this was through political activity, and another way was through music. It's really telling to me that music features so strongly in the film of Jimmy's Hall. A film about 1930s Ireland highlights New York jazz as well as the traditional music that was being recorded in New York at that time by the recent emigrants from Leitrim and Sligo. The counter topographies that Grelton helped to delineate, whether that was political action or the corrupting influence of jazz, were a threat to people in power, but they've resurfaced and they've gained new resonance today. In an uncertain and precarious world, migration and migrants have the potential to become scapegoats for all kinds of changes and all kinds of insecurities. In such a context, the tendency is to frame migration in relation to dominant state concerns, such as illegality, criminality, or potential threats to security, well-being, or sovereignty. While a focus on the state may help us understand structural issues, for example, around employment or around migrant status, it's less useful in helping us to think about other, perhaps more symbolic issues. For that, we need to consider people's everyday experiences, the stories they tell, and the ways that they attempt to develop their sense of belonging through local and national country topographies, despite the everyday challenges they face. Thank you. Photographs first and applause after. <laughs>
state. And I think it's really important to understand the structural conditions that make belonging possible. So if you're settled in a place, if you um, have formal belonging in that place, for example, through citizenship, then that makes belonging less complicated for you. It doesn't make it po always possible. It doesn't mean it's inevitable. But states and how states shape who does and doesn't belong really matters. But people create senses of belonging in different ways. So people can create a sense of belonging in terms of the connections they have with place, the connections they have with other people. It can be local, it can be stretched across a range of different localities. And one of the issues that we found really interesting, uh, Bettina and I in the research that we did as the recession hit, was that counter to popular opinion, um, migrants living in Ireland who lost their jobs didn't leave Ireland because they had created social connections, because they had developed relationships, because they felt more at home and more able to be themselves when living in Ireland. So the state really matters. And I think we see how the state matters in our setting, in universities, around the status of international students who live very precarious lives in Ireland. And the time that they spend as students doesn't count as formal residence for the purposes of citizenship. So we're seeing the consequences of that in ways that are really damaging and disrupting to people's lives because they're unable to plan in any kind of way for their future. Um, so it does matter. But the other level, which is about place belongingness, and that place can be local or national or global or connected to particular groups of people, that effective dimension of belonging is also important. Um, other questions? Steve? I see. Uh, right, right. There's a microphone oh, coming to you. Uh, thanks for the talk. That's also very interesting and, and stimulating. I, I see communities in around South and City Dublin that seem to have come in and thrive. And, and I, I've been told there's a lot of self financing goes on and the sales, you know, businesses get run through interpersonal loans and they, they sort of operate outside the state in that way. Is that a common thing for migrants communities to do? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a very common response of migrants and migrant communities. Um, learning how to navigate a new place is difficult and getting support from, there are awkward terms to describe it, but co-ethnics is often a way of people navigating that. So, I mean, I, I always keep harking back to examples from Irish emigration, but I think it's really important to do that, to try and understand all the commonalities of people's experiences. If we think about what happened to Irish emigrants in the US or the UK, the role of the Catholic Church, the role of the Irish pub, particularly for construction workers, and now in today's world, the role of the GAA in creating that sense and that network where people support each other, often because formal support from the state isn't available or is difficult to access. So that sense of self-reliance matters, is important, and it gives people, I suppose, a form of security in an unfamiliar place. The problem is if we, um, allow our societies to be fully reliant on small groups supporting each other rather than understanding the broader structural barriers that they face. Yes, back here. Thanks very much, Mary, that was fantastic. Um, I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about how states could or should value belonging. Um, states currently value belonging through citizenship. So it's formal belonging that matters in terms of how states construct their sense of self and also construct their sense of the people who are worthy of their support. But of course, citizenship as a concept is one that isn't um, equally understood across a whole range of different contexts. So we see it in Ireland right now. Um, we see the rush to taking out Irish citizenship by people living in a nearby, on a nearby island who are a little worried about what Brexit might mean for their European mobility. And in that, we see that in Ireland, we have a quite loose interpretation of citizenship as it extends to the diaspora, but perhaps a more restricted understanding of citizenship as a formal sense of belonging in Ireland. If we were to follow that example through, 
then we would surely be pointing to voting rights for Irish citizens living outside Ireland. And we should also be thinking about extended voting rights for people living in Ireland um, who are not yet citizens, but because there's no long-term residency category in Ireland, um, aren't able to avail of that. So we can absolutely mark belonging. The state can mark belonging through access to citizenship, um, through access to voting rights, and also in thinking about public services and whether or not public services actually represent the public they're serving. Thanks, Mary. That was a great talk. And uh, I checked my watch and I thought only 20 minutes had gone by, but I'm back on five minutes had gone by. So <laughs> I think it's a real measure of, of, of really enjoying your talk. Um, but I wanted to ask you about, um, about language, because in a, in a sense, when you talk about migration, uh, Irish migration to the US, well, we had the advantage of language. And I was just wondering uh, if you could speak a little bit to the role of language in the sense of belonging and migration. Yeah, language. Language is crucial in terms of who you can communicate with. Though many people would argue <coughs> the kind of early migration to the US that many of those migrants were Irish speakers and others spoke English in a way that wasn't recognized by the wasps in the cities that they were moving to. So language, even if it's allegedly a shared language, can become a marker of difference. The phrase that I've heard used in Canada that I really like is audible minority. Um, any of you who are old like me and who went to England like during the troubles, be very aware of what your Irish accent meant the minute you opened your mouth there. So I so suppose in one point, language, your mother tongue isn't an uncomplicated thing and it can mark you as different in other places. But absolutely being able to facilitate communication through people in whatever language is possible really matters as well. It's something we do really badly in Ireland. We don't think about public services, for example, in terms of languages other than English. We've bought into the myth of English as a global language and we're quite happy to work with that myth and expect that others um, take on the burden of learning, of learning English. And we also, in an Irish context, don't make formal language classes easily available to migrants who want to learn English. So in other countries where um, the state provides that kind of language training, um, it, it makes it, uh, you know, it's a public service. We've privatized that in many instances, so people struggle to, to get by. Um, I see Danielle McGoughan from Crosscare here uh, she was author of a recent report by Crosscare, which was about whether or not the Department of Social Welfare was making people aware of their right to have access to a translator when they were trying to access services. And it's a very important report to read just because of how this right was not being exercised or not being, um, migrants were not being made aware of this right. And this is the kind of everyday geography and everyday barrier that we face. But we also face another problem here, which is that we're deeply suspicious of multilingualism. We see it in our approach to the Irish language. We struggle with thinking that people should be communicating easily in a whole range of different languages. And increasingly, we, we uh, teach languages. Uh, we want people to be correct in their languages rather than able to communicate. So we need to consider what that means also in terms of how we create the context for people to to communicate in that way. Um, when Bettina and I were doing research, when uh, we spoke to a lot of migrants from uh, the newer EU countries, so like Poland and Lithuania and so on, and we discovered that often they liked going to pubs where there was music, so they didn't actually have to talk. And the importance of music, I think, as a way of creating a space for people to be present without necessarily having to struggle with making themselves understood is really important. I'm going to apologise for the 45 minutes because I, I timed it as 40. I'm blaming, my, <laughs> I'm blaming my nerves in front of this group. So. Anybody else? Yes. Thanks, Mary. Um, I have a geographical question for you. So it relates, I was thinking about the Raven State map that you had and the way you talked about it. And you also talked about your recent work about how uh, migrant groups are experiencing ch challenges differently, spatially across the country. So, we so this is based on a project that I did with Jenny Dagg, who's now based at NUI Galway. And we wanted to use existing um, 
data, existing state gathered data to see if we could identify uh, differences, uh, spatial differences in terms of uh, integration outcomes. So we looked at two regions in particular, we looked at the Dublin region and the border region. And we chose them because they had different migrant profiles and different socioeconomic profiles. So the challenges that people face vary depending on where they live, because where people live shapes their opportunities and the barriers that they encounter. So there's a long report, I can direct you to it later, but in a nutshell, people, migrants living in Dublin uh, find it easier to access work and often work that is commensurate with their skills and their training, but find it very difficult to access housing, decent quality housing. Whereas migrants living in the border region find it easier to access housing, but the quality of work that's available to them is significantly lower. Sorry, uh, do you think sport can act as a means of facilitating uh, migrant sense of belonging, or can it act as a barrier in some cases? Um, that's an interesting question. I think sport can, but how sport is organised in Ireland is very gendered. So I, my sense is that sport is becoming important for young boys and for young men in Ireland, but a little less so for young women. Um, I do in my book have a little bit of a go at the GAA, so I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to repeat it here, it's in chapter 5 if anyone wants to read it. <laughs> But uh, the GAA's approach has been a little problematic. Um, I think it's improved in the last few years. Um, soccer's been a little bit different, but I shouldn't really use soccer um, as a good example of anything right now. But um, sport is gendered, and access to sport and sporting facilities is a class dimension to it too. So um, having an equality of access is important. We're not seeing the equality of access. Um, whether or not that can translate into some form of integration through um, the support for sporting teams rather than necessarily playing at sport is something that is probably worth looking at. There's a lot of gap in front of it. I'm curious about the number of times, both in the lecture and in the questions that we refer to our own experience. doesn't really connect to how we perceive, or does it, to how we perceive others migrating to us? Um, it's interesting in the Irish context. I, I, I keep doing this because I want, I, I mean, I do it when I teach about migration. I do it when I write about migration because I want people to make those links. I want them to link um, the experiences of migrants they don't know to the experiences of migrants they do know. And it's very difficult in the Irish context to encounter people who don't have direct experience of migration. But I think that how we organise this society is dominated by the people who didn't migrate, by the, people, by the people who remained in place. I think our literature shows a deep suspicion of the returned migrant. There's always a fear that the returned migrant is going to come, take land, cause social chaos, do whatever it is migrants do. So we have that deep-rooted cultural fear uh, what, I noticed, what I've noticed for a long time in doing research on migration is that many of the Irish people involved in uh, migrant supporting activities are people who've lived outside Ireland for a long time. So I think that perhaps to make, it's a generalisation, it doesn't hold for everybody, but I think people who've had direct experiences of migration themselves may have a different understanding of what it means to be a migrant. Any final questions before we... Yes. David, and another one here, sorry. I love the piece there around what it feels like coming to you with that question from John Bolton's and photography. I love the question about what feels like coming to you and the John, the John Bolton's work. And I like how it represents it and using photographs for that to answer those questions, and also kind of photographs as a site of memory. And this kind of, this kind of brings you back to this idea of creating home and belonging. Uh, and I just wondered if you'd also done work, if you'd come across any work that you were involved with on uh, the use of internet and digital communities for migrants uh, in second interface. Uh, it came up in some of the interviews that we did, um, particularly people using 
Skype, for example, to maintain connections with grandparents. Um, but other people have done more direct work, kind of like Becky King O'Reilly in, in the sociology department here, who's written explicitly about um, the use of technology to maintain connections. But it's a, it's a really important thing, and, and I encountered it when I spent time on a sabbatical in Toronto, joining the Irish in You in Toronto Facebook page, which has been a fascinating insight into the concerns of all those uh, young adventurers in Toronto and the kinds of issues that they look for help from people they don't know in that sense of community creating again there are similar facebook pages for large migrant groups in ireland like brazilians um, and uh, expat brits there's also a forum for expat brits in ireland too so i think i think it's crucial i think i think but i think the point that i'm trying to make is people have always had those connections we just react we respond to technological change and adapt to that technological change which may alter the particular form of the connection, but doesn't fundamentally affect the, the reality that people who want to stay connected do, and also people who want to disappear through migration manage to do that also. Thank you, Mary. It's a really rich um, talk, and you've done so many different projects individually, collaboratively with your students. Um, what is probably one of the biggest surprises that you've learned or heard from in terms of the different people that you've uh, worked with and interviewed. I was especially taken when you were talking about the differences of just interviewing with people from different fields and um, you know, not challenging somebody as, as well as then just letting them talk and listening. So it, it seems to me that you were listening and so that you were trying to learn also from the people that you worked with. And so I'm just really curious, what, was, what, what would be one of the bigger surprises that you encountered in terms of uh, questions of belonging and, and barriers? I suppose it gives rise to a number of different answers. <clears throat> I mean, one surprise, one important surprise, particularly when you've come out of a PhD program, a highly individualized um, way of thinking about knowledge, is that actually some of the best research experiences I've had have been collaborating with others. So while I suppose it's not always a surprise, um, the reality of that is something that's hit me and stayed with me, um, the, the importance of doing that. And in terms of um, research findings and surprise around research findings, I think in that project with Bettina, it was the recognition of British people living in Ireland as migrants, which is something I'd never considered before and was forced to confront in lots of very moving interviews with people who share the language, um, who understood some or many of the cultural references, but had but experienced particular kinds of challenges to belonging. I think sometimes the challenges that come as a direct result of state practice, state behaviours can be actually a little bit easier to identify. And often it's the effect of barriers that people face that can be more difficult to see and more surprising when you encounter them. But I do discover from interviewing with Bettina that it's okay to argue with the people that you're interviewing. <laughs> <laughs> Only for fully trained sociologists. <laughs> okay, thank you all. First of all, Mary, thank you um, on, on behalf of this uh, enraptured audience uh, for a wonderful inaugural lecture, and also on behalf of the University of the Wider Community for the work that you do and that you've uh, uh, presented here today. And thank you all uh, for coming. Um, uh, it was a well spent um, hour of your time, I'm sure you'll agree. And we now have. Um, Various delights. He's <laughs> <laughs> the evening out at the end of the room. Thank you, Mary. Thank you.